Thank you, hello. This classic photo was taken on December 7th of 1972. The Apollo 17 spacecraft turned around halfway between Earth and the Moon and took this picture of our Earth. This picture has become known as the blue marble, and the reason for that is, for the first time, people saw how much of our Earth was actually blue, and we started to think of it as a blue planet rather than a green planet. I'm here today to tell you about a revolution that's happening in ocean science and what it means for me and for all of you. Most of us, when we're sitting in our office or we're sitting here at school or we're driving down an urban highway, we don't give a lot of thought to the ocean. When you're looking out at a cityscape like this, you might be more concentrating on what you have to do in the next five minutes than that big blue expanse of water that covers 70% of our planet. When you go on a hike in a beautiful forest, you're surrounded by nature, by trees, by a running stream, but you might not be thinking very much of the ocean. When you've had the chances I have, though, to go out on the water so far away that you can't see land anymore in any direction, you realize how small one person or one boat is compared to this huge expanse of salty water that covers most of our planet. I recently traveled to New Zealand, and my flight was direct from Vancouver to Auckland, and I had a window seat. You wouldn't believe what a strange experience it is to fly for 14 hours at 800 kilometers an hour and realize that all you can see out your window is the Pacific Ocean. It's enormous. Now, although we talk about the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Arctic Ocean, the Southern Ocean, these are really all one big ocean. And why is that? They're connected by a system of currents that's sometimes called the global conveyor belt. So when we think about the ocean, we should really think of it as one, whether we're here, in British Columbia, or we're standing on the coast of China. Why, do, why should we care about the ocean? What does it do for us? So first of all, the ocean regulates our weather. The ocean drives winds and hurricanes. The ocean also helps to moderate the temperature on Earth. Right now, in an era of climate change, one of the things that is happening is a lot more heat is being pumped into our atmosphere. The ocean is helping us to absorb that heat. Water cools and warms much more slowly than air does. Another thing is that the ocean is a habitat for a vast diversity of different species. According to the Census of Marine Life, over 250,000 different species that are larger than microbes have been identified in the scientific literature. This is a huge number, but scientists estimate that there are up to two million species out there. So that means we've only identified one-eighth of them at this point. The ocean also has some mysterious ecosystems, like this one here, where we see hydrothermal vents. So in an area where two tectonic plates are diverging, we have volcanically active areas on the seafloor, that host unique organisms like the tube worms that you just saw. So while all this is happening in our oceans, it's a big place, we've explored very little, we're already seeing a lot of change, though. The ocean is also helping us to absorb all the carbon that we're putting into our atmosphere. When we burn fossil fuels and CO2 is emitted into our atmosphere, the ocean takes in a lot of that CO2. And through a chemical reaction that occurs, the ocean becomes more acidic because of this. This picture up here are oysters from an oyster farm. In order to be healthy, oysters need to form a shell. They form this out of calcium carbonate. And when the ocean becomes more acidic, it's harder and harder for these oysters to form their shells. So a lot of species are being affected by these changes that are happening in our ocean. Now, not only those, but some species, such as the big fish in our ocean, are being harmed directly by human activity. Overfishing, I'm sure you've heard, is a big issue. The bluefin tuna, and especially the Atlantic bluefin tuna, may well go extinct during our lifetime. 
If you live in the Vancouver area, you might be interested to know that at one time there were, only, there were over 50 streams in the Vancouver area that supported salmon spawning. Now due to urban sprawl like this, the airport, there are only two of those streams left. So when you ask the question, why are salmon not as abundant in the Strait of Georgia as they once were, this is part of the explanation. So we've explored very little of the ocean, but we're having a huge effect on it. And in fact, scientists estimate that at this time, we've only explored 5% of the volume of the ocean, which means 95% of it is unexplored. When we care about conservation and we care about stewardship, and we want to preserve this resource that's essential to all life on Earth, how can we preserve it and how can we work effectively if we don't even know what's out there? So it's really important to know what we have in the ocean so that we know what we have to work to conserve. Well, so how do scientists find out about the ocean? Well, in the past and in the present, most ocean research is done from ships like this one. This is one of our Coast Guard ships in Canada, the John P. Tully. What this means is that observations that are made about the ocean are made at a specific point in time and space where that ship is located. With modern advances in technology, we can extend our reach to the deep sea using robots, for example. Now, this is a scientific submersible. It's one of the most advanced ones in the world, and it's also uh, located right here near um, Victoria. It's called Ropos. It has two manipulator arms, and it's controlled on the ship by a team of three or four people. One person flies it with a joystick, just like you would in a video game, and two people have controllers for the arms. This is really, really amazing to see. So this type of robot lets us have a virtual presence in the deep sea. Here's what it looks like on the ship. Those HD monitors at the top of the picture are what the pilots use to see what the robot is seeing. And in the front row, you can see a person who's controlling the robot. And in the back row, you can see the scientists and engineers that are directing the operations. Now, I've been in this control room, and you can't imagine what an amazing experience it is to see something like those hydrothermal vents that look totally foreign to those of us that spend most of our time on land, and then to walk outside on the deck of the ship and see that picture with the blue water all around. And you ask yourself, how is this possible when I'm looking at something that's so familiar to me, the surface of the ocean, and yet I walk inside and I see this mysterious realm underneath me with billowing water at 350 degrees. Now I've told you about these robots and I've, we also have remote sensing equipment. It's really advanced our capacity to do ocean observation. But we're still limited in time and space to where that ship and that robot are located. When we go to sea in my organization, it costs us $1 per second to be out there. So this is over $80,000 a day. By the time you pay for the fuel, the ship and its crew, the submersible and its crew, and all our staff time, we're spending an awful lot of money. Not very many people in the world have the opportunity to do what I do, and I feel very privileged that I've had that chance. But how can we include more people in this? So for the reason that we'd like to make ocean science more inclusive, scientists and engineers are transforming the way that we do ocean observation. And the way that they are doing this is through cabled ocean observatories. Around the world, we are laying deep sea cables that carry power and communication to scientific instruments on the seafloor. Those scientific instruments make observations and relay their data via the cables to an archive. And then from there, it's made available to the world through a web portal. This picture right here is a camera, and you can see the camera has a curious visitor on it. And in the background is an instrument platform which is used to relay the data that the camera is collecting. What's pretty cool about this is that the information is available in real time, right away. 
This picture here was taken just minutes after one of these observatories was put in the water, and already we could see streaming data on a laptop. That's really exciting. That lets us, and in fact anyone in the world who has an internet connection, be present in the deep sea in a way we've never been able to before. By having a real-time connection, scientists can also interact with the instruments at depth. This is a seafloor crawler deployed in 870 meters, so almost one kilometer of water, and it's controlled by a team of researchers in Germany. At Ocean Networks Canada, we operate two large cabled observatories, the Neptune Observatory and the Venus Observatory. These are the two of the most advanced observatories in the world. Um, the Neptune Observatory, which is the big loop that you see there, is 800 kilometers long, and you're looking at the west coast of Vancouver Island. So its data is collected everywhere from the coast, down the continental slope, across the tectonic plate, and out to the area where we find the hydrothermal vents, where the Juan de Fuca plate and the Pacific plate are diverging. The Venus Observatory is in Saanich Inlet in the Strait of Georgia. So what I'm here to tell you today is that something even more exciting is happening, and that is the technology that's gone into developing these large observatories has been adapted for local installations. We call these community observatories. They can be deployed anywhere that an internet connection and power is available for the instruments. Right now, there are two of these observatories in operation. One of them is in Mill Bay with a shore station at Brentwood College School. And the other one is in the Canadian High Arctic in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. So what can we do with these? Why do we care? This is some data from Cambridge Bay. And I want to point out to you that when you're looking at this, you can quite quickly make some observations that will tell you some interesting things about the ocean. The squiggly light blue line is the air temperature, and the darker blue line is the seawater temperature in the same place. Remember I told you that the ocean helps us moderate our temperature and that the ocean can absorb a lot of heat? What you can see here quite easily is that there's a lot more variation in the air temperature than the water temperature. The air in Cambridge Bay went down to about minus 40 degrees, and it went up to 20 in the summer, but the water temperature stayed pretty close to zero the whole time. So this is the kind of observation that people now can make about their own environment in their, at their own pace and for their own purposes. All right, I hope you're excited about this, and I hope that you're thinking, well, how can I participate? So that's what I'm here to tell you. There are many ways at this point. If you're a student, you can study ocean science. Ocean science is an interdisciplinary field. You could study physics, you could study chemistry, or you could study engineering or computer science. So I hope you realize by now that this is a high-tech field. And I myself, my background is not in marine biology, as you may have guessed at first. It is in computer science. And I find that very exciting because I love computers, I love high-tech, and I'm passionate about the environment and about the ocean. So it's the greatest match. I now get to put computers in the ocean. <clears throat> We're also running a program which students at your school are participating in, but students at other schools can look for similar programs in their area. OceanSense is a program that connects students and teachers over great distances through oceanographic data. So sharing local observations and making global connections. But let's say you're not a student and you're not a researcher and you still want to take part because you care about the ocean and you want to learn more. You can be a citizen scientist. There are programs out there like Digital Fishers that this boy is playing, which allow you to participate in scientific research. So through Digital Fishers, he's able to make observations up in deep sea video. Those observations are recorded and then made available to scientists. So this means that anybody anywhere is now able to participate in science in a way that was never possible before. Okay, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you don't want to look at data, but you still care about the ocean. So what else can you do? 
You can talk about it. We here live in a beautiful place on the west coast of Canada. We have access to abundant seafood. We do water sports like stand-up paddleboarding and kayaking. We can go outside and we can look at the ocean. I grew up in Ontario, and in Ontario I wasn't very close at all to the ocean. But I can tell my friends and I can tell my relatives. I can talk to my friend in Beijing about the ocean. This is a really important thing to do. Find out about something that you care about and then tell other people about it, and you'll also be making a contribution. Finally, you can support the idea of more environmental monitoring. If we don't have a baseline of data, we don't know what's out there, we don't know how many species there are, we won't know what we've lost or changed. You can support a community observatory in your area. But most importantly, you can get out and you can let people know that the ocean is important to you and important to all of us. So when you leave, I want you to ask yourself the question, if you care about the ocean, what can I do? What can you do? What can we all do to conserve one of Earth's most important resources? Thank you.